so, very good. So, I, I promise you I'm more excited about this presentation than you guys are, so thank you for your time this morning. And uh, I've been waiting to share this story for quite a while now. The topic is Urban Prairies and Perspective at Indiana Anderson Cancer Center. And my name is David Ranger, I'm a silly project manager there. And while this presentation is not about Indiana, I will say that it's an amazing place dedicated to cancer treatment, research, education, prevention, and with more work frequency now, and more emphasis survivorship. And I work for an innovative facilities management group with an eye to sustainability. And that's going to become more apparent as we go through this presentation this morning. Okay, so my primary role is over the grounds and maintenance operations for our 228 Houston campus. It's actually 254. We just purchased 34 acres out on I-10 by the uh, Barker Reservoir, SD. And 
we've, all, we've already begun to talk about this message of sustainability. It's kind of overarching in everything that we're doing. Now, I will say that these six steps, they're not really steps that you're going to follow, per se, to create your own query. They're more symbolic of the stages or phases that we went through to arrive at the, at the point we are today. Now, we'll look on the pair as we go through this. Okay. So, step one, of course, is to designate a site. If you're going to create a, a pocket query, it can be a few container of plants on your porch, it can be a thousand acre uh, rangeland. Okay? So here's our area. This is the uh, former Prudential building. You guys see the, uh, the rock logo on the top? This picture is from 1952, I believe, looking at the Texas Medical Center. And uh, <laughs> most of that property is now in the Anderson. That's uh, Holcomb and Fanta Drive. Okay. So this is the area that we're going to be working with and talking about today. It's this green, green area, is about seven acres. Okay. Here's the building in the more modern times. So step one is to designate a site, and there happens to be a building on it. You need to get rid of the building, right? <laughs> okay, so that's what we're going to look at real quick. There's a little awkward silence here. Fast forward. This might be loud. Can't do it without us now. But well, we're going to have to use the interest of time. Imagine the professional. Shape the screen. So I'd like to say that we removed the building just to have a very good it's, it's not really the case. So this building, uh, this video is all on. It's called the HMB Implosion. If you search YouTube, you'll be able to find that. Listen to the audio. All right, so there's the mess that came out in this neat little pile of debris. And over the next several months, construction crews worked to clear that and uh, filled in everything. Okay. So step one, you can remove the building. All right. <laughs> step two, see, I call this seed in the closet. Now this is an important step. This is more about educating the end user about what to expect. What are they getting? In this case, uh, we knew that we were going to have a seven acre park to design. In Bill, but uh, about this time we were approached by uh, this guy named Jaime Gonzalez with the King Curry Reserves. He said, Hey guys, why don't you put in a pocket, a pocket uh, curry? And uh, after kind of rolling our eyes at each other and, and making a few jokes, uh, we said, Okay, well, we'll listen. And this, you know, I had a lot of misconceptions about what a curry was. I thought it was this ubiquitous sea of grass, kind of like uh, cereal grains, and I thought it was perfectly flat. And uh, come to find out, it's none of us. So, in order to, uh, by this time, the decision was made that we're going to have a curry. And in order for us to really fully support it, we had to understand a little bit about curries. So, we looked at a few things here. I'm going to go through these one, one at a time here. So, we wanted to understand the cultural and historical significance, first and foremost. And, uh, you know, here we see some Catalan. This is actually Galveston Island in 1870. So, a very old picture. And, for those of you that aren't aware of the, the impact that the cattle ranching industry has had on our state's uh, history, Texas history, you might not be a Texan, but uh, what you need to know <laughs> is that the prairies provided a seemingly infinite rangeland for livestock to graze upon. Okay? So this picture, see 1870, and what that makes it about 144 years old, right? It's pretty fantastic. I also like this picture because it proves something. That I've suspected. There are UFOs on the prairie. Alright, housing and agriculture. So, this is another piece of the prairie uh, early on in time. Was it easy to build on a prairie? Yes, because there were any trees at that time, right? So, you didn't have to expend the energy to clear your land. But people quickly found out that prairies were very fertile ground for agriculture. And uh, one of my professors told me that uh, prairies were fertile because of the, the high percentage of organic matter and the rapid accumulation of thatch and biomass from the prairie. <coughs> I, I believe that. Okay, so we also looked at the ecology. We're not looking to be environmental scientists, we're just trying to get a kind of a 40,000 foot perspective on everything. So we looked at the topography as well. 
learned about these things called prairie mounds and potholes. Well, uh, turns out, as I mentioned, the prairie was not flat. It consisted of a series of mounds and depressions called potholes. Each mound and pothole supports a unique uh, community of wildlife and plant species. Each one is also its own little micro watershed. And collectively, these micro watersheds coalesce into the vast wetlands that once served as pre filters for fresh water flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. It's not really the case anymore. We have that on a limited scale. So I, I love Google Earth and play with it all the time. And uh, this is, there's some great imagery of the Houston area going back to 1944. If you guys know how to slide that little uh, ruler back. Anyway, this is a great example of what I'm talking about these, with these pop depressions. You see the darker areas, a different type of vegetation. You can also see sand and water. And you see the lighter upland areas. And those little white symbol patterns, those are, uh, those are the prairie mounds or medium mounds. Uh, see your question? I don't know. Um, okay, so um, yeah, this is all available on Google Earth. Anyway, so you see, you see some of the car here, and here's that area today: Highway 8 and Highway 15. Okay. All right, so here's one more. Um, again, exact same thing. This is the, this is the opposite side of town. You see the the, the depressions, the uh, the medium mounds, the pimple mounds. You see this line staying through there, so it's a watershed. Okay, here's that area today. It's really thin. Now there is one little section over here. You guys see that? Does anyone know anyone know what that is? Deer Park area, right? So this is representative of the remaining one percent of the original coastal prairie. This little section, for those of you that don't know, has never been cultivated, never been plowed. It's what we call a remnant, a prairie remnant. So that's the next step of this process. We went there. We went to visit the Deer Park area. And I can tell you, from 100 yards away, walking up to it, excuse me, it wasn't flat. It wasn't uh, this ubiquitous sea of, of uh, barley or meat. And, uh, you know, I started to see things that I had never seen before. I grew up in East Texas playing in the, in the Piney Woods. And I'm walking out on this prairie amidst these. Uh, Strange and unusual plants that I've never seen before. Coneflowers as tall as I am, blooms as big as my hand. And uh, this, uh, the forest of the atris, right? I, don't, I typically don't see that out in East Texas. So, um, and it looks deliberately planted. That was pretty interesting too. This guy, this guy really caught my attention. Rattlesnake master, strange jungle like foliage and odd looking blooms. So, needless to say, after after learning all this and experiencing the uh, Deer Park Prairie, we had the full commitment to making our pocket prairie work. Okay, so step three is to establish the prairie. This is where we actually begin the process to seed and plant uh, some of the some of the forbs and uh, prairie grasses. So we don't know anything, right? Just a, a month ago, we thought prior to this, we thought the prairie was flat and made out of cereal grains, and uh, we needed a marker. We talked about Katie Curry Conservancy. I want to mention the Wildlife Habitat Federation, Jim Willis. I don't know if you guys know, know him. And Sustainable Growth Texas. These guys have all played a role in establishing our prairie. Okay, so we collected seeds. There were lots of wild collected seeds from the actual Deer Park Prairie. That's pretty cool. We uh, also purchased a lot uh, coastal prairie mix and uh, individual species from Native American seeds. There were several different planting methods. Uh, some of them were higher seeded. Uh, others were broadcast by hand in culture packets, pressing them into the soil with a little machine. And we also had a lot of container grown plants out there. Now, some of these container grown plants were brought out by Jim Willis and, and the wildlife uh, habitat guys. And uh, they were en route to uh, Andy Anderson to do some work. And they, they saw some gander grass growing in a ditch in, on the side of the county road. So they pulled over and they dug that gander grass out. Every time the car would try to find a drop show, it would stand up. The car would go by and then start hitting things. We had some hijacked plants out there. Okay. This is a video still. Uh, this is the poor volley, but for those of you that don't know, this is what fiber seeding looks like. So the seeds are mixed in a tank in that truck back there, and it's agitated, there's a green dye added in there, there's a fertilizer, a paper pulp, and it's sprayed out of the ground. This is kind of a vestige of my past as a contractor. So here's our prairie. What do you guys think? It's not, it's not my glamour <laughs> talk. I'm saving glamour talk for later. 
This is at a very early successional stage here. And I uh, say this is probably a month or two after, after doing some of the initial seeding, maybe a little bit longer. But you see some activity out there. That's a wildlife habitat generation, uh, planting sprigs that are uh, rising under the, uh, some, some of the grasses. They are broadcasting some seed out there using their cultivator. cultivator okay? And uh, here's our plant list. I know you guys can't see that, but what you need to know is that there are 28 grass species and 38 four species. Fours are wild flowers. Okay, if you don't know that, I didn't know that two years ago. But interestingly, there are more four species than grass, right? So again, it's not this ubiquitous sea of cereal grains. Okay, so here's our park. It's looking a little better here. This is the winter of 2012, I believe. Uh, just after it was built, and you see some of the, so the, the building side of the oval in the background, the uh, foreground is the prairie, the bottom prairie. It's about two, two acres, just shy of two acres altogether. All right, here's some uh, early growth. You see these rosettes forming on the ground. Okay, so by this time, you know, we were happy. We had our seed range in the ground, we had some germination, and uh, we'll go on to the next step here. Now, I have been adding, and I can't number uh, very well, I can't count to six, there's actually seven, there's actually uh, seven steps in here, so we have two, two step fours. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I wonder if anyone will catch that. I'll point it out for you to so I look intelligent. All right, so in step four is the junk start and soil ecology. We had germination, we had our, our seed bank in the ground, uh, but we, we knew that we needed more. Now, those old school professors of mine, you know, they, they taught me that plants needed just a few things to live. They needed, uh, they needed some sunlight, they needed some water, uh, a little fertilizer on their head, and uh, of course the minerals and the soil. That's it. There was very little, if any, emphasis on the soil and ecology. Well, it turns out that plants need a whole lot more than that. And that uh, um, and we were missing, we were missing that in our soil. Our, our soil was, uh, oh, let me get to this next slide here. I want to, so we, we were introduced to uh, Dr. Lane in the soil, from the Soil Food Med class, and uh, she talks about how plants need much more than just the minerals in the soil. They are dependent on the biology in the soil and the interactions of these microorganisms with soil particles, air, water, uh, and the roots of the plants. And through this process, which I can't explain fully, that's why we have John Ferguson here, he's going to field questions at the end of the presentation. Okay. Uh, so I can't really explain this mechanism uh, fully because it's not the way I was trained, but uh, we have enough sense to understand that uh, in order for our plants to thrive, we needed to, we needed to improve the soil biology in our highly disturbed soils that we ended up with at the uh, prairie. So soil quality depends on perspective. Depends on perspective. And uh, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, the engineers were telling us that we had great soil. We had awesome soil to grow plants in. Actually, they didn't say grow plants. They just said we had great soil. Well, if you're an engineer, and yes, that's true. We had great soil to compact and build a foundation on. Have great properties, but uh, it wasn't sufficient for growing plants. It didn't have that established rhizosphere. Okay. So health, plant health depends on what soil health. We talked about that. So the way that we jump started this process in and try to build the, uh, the, the biological profile of soil is to hire sustainable growth of Texas to brew and aerate a living compost tea, teeming with micro, uh, microorganisms, and they spray it on the soil, spray it on the little rosettes, and that inoculates the soil and uh, begins the process. So something to consider that's important, and this is uh, something that uh, people who associate with John Person and Dr. Lane even know, is that the ratio of fungi and bacteria in the soil is important. A mature, uh, mature uh, ecosystem like a hardwood forest is going to have fungal dominant soils. A, uh, an early succession uh, uh, planting group or planting community, plant community on a uh, highly dispersed soil is going to be more bacterial. So hurry plants are kind of in the middle. We're, uh, we're, I think we have a one-to-one -one ratio of fungi and bacteria. Okay, so did it work? Well, no one's actually taking plate counts and measuring this right now, but uh, we think it did work because just a few months later we had an effective tall grass prairie. And so remember, the, remember those little tiny rosettes? We had about five feet of growth uh, that summer. And uh, 
almost complete ground cover. It's really great. Okay. Here we are in the winter of 2013, I believe. This is going after, this is after a couple of uh, free cycles. You see the dead road right there. And uh, here we are emerging in the spring of this year. So it's looking radically different from just 12 months ago. And we're starting to see uh, some diversity as well. Uh, here you see just a sample. We're going to look at this in more detail as we go on. Okay, so here's my other step for <laughs> And uh, but this that remains 
one of the effective purposes of having our hot period. Okay. And with the, with the uh, native plants comes the wildlife, right? So these are some pictures of the random pollinators that we saw. I can't tell you what any of those are, but I'm not sure. I just know that they're all different. <laughs> okay. We also heard other pollinators, other types of wildlife coming out. We saw Mr. Rabbit in our patients love the looking at rabbits. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, well, let me just take a look at that right now. So, uh, you know, viewing wildlife is linked to in having increased compassion and improved relationships, right? And uh, are those two important things to recognize and have in a hospital setting when you have a loved one who's sick? Okay, so I drove by this morning to look at the wildlife and I saw these guys out there. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Put in there yesterday. <laughs>
the wildscape, you can use it off of the wildscape uh, designation zone and have your yard certified. But those third party those third party validations build credibility for what you're doing. And, uh, and it's even better if it comes from a Texas Parks and Wildlife government uh, entity. So we'll point out that our camera up here was about three feet tall, so we had to dig a hole for Ivy to stand in. Not yet. It's a water source. I told him he was going to be the. He's going to receive a lot of bad jokes. Missouri is also an educational venue. Uh, so we work on hosting guided tours out there occasionally. Uh, there are work groups. It's a venue for work groups. I know that, that uh, Katie Murray has brought out uh, some Texas Master of Naturalists uh, to do some work out there. I myself am a, am a student, a Texas Master Naturalist student. And I find it terribly ironic that I might end up on Elm Prairie doing volunteer work. That's kind of weird. We do a lot of hands on activities, and we also have interpretive signage for the introverts like me that don't want to be bothered with other people. We can go look at our signs and read them by ourselves. So here's one of the activities that you see, and we advertise this internally, it's not open to the public. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's going to happen on Sunday. Okay, this is Christine Mansfield with the Katie Prairie Conservancy making uh, cookies or something like that. Seed balls. Okay? <laughs> what we do is get people involved. We get these are some of the hands on the activities. So people that attend these tours actually make the seed balls and then they go out in the prairie and throw them. And that does a couple things. It gives them a sense of ownership. And uh, so next time they hear someone asking about that wheat patch, they they can speak up. No, no, it's not a wheat patch, it's my prairie. I don't and uh, it, you know, it breaks down barriers. These, these little activities break down barriers. They start talking to each other. They start talking about the prairie. Okay, even the men do it. We'll point out that not everyone in Indiana is a girl. Like a girl. <laughs> Dr. Mansfield in the middle is doing okay, but I need to work on those other two. <laughs> Here's Heidi holding up the signs, and uh, these are the interpretive signs I have to talk about. Uh, they're really great. They tell stories succinctly. You know everything that I'm talking about right now in a you know 30 second read. It's pretty neat. Okay, and then the, another use for the prairie, which is emerging, this is kind of interesting, is research and observation. Uh, I didn't consider this initially, but uh, but it, it, it's a venue for research and observation. I'll give you some examples. There is a uh, professor from a uh, researcher. U of H, Dr. Crosby, don't quote me that, but she's from U of H. She comes out, she has been out to study <coughs> the orthopterans and look at the variety out there. Uh, orthopterans are the canids, crickets, and uh, grasshoppers. So, a mature ancient prairie sand might have 30 species of orthopterans out there. How many were at the Andy Anderson two acre prairie that's only two years old? Anybody? 11. So. That's, I think that's pretty significant. All right. Where did they come? We didn't order them all. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't come from the little baggie. Terrible. How many diversity? This is pretty interesting. So our own Michael Eckenfeld, where is he? I saw him coming here. Raise your hand. He's uh, one of my colleagues at the University who works there. He's a Texas Master Naturalist. In the Gulf Coast chapter, and he does work with a researcher out of Boston, and he's been collecting honey uh, sets out his little trays and uh, catalogs them. How many different species of honeybees are on our two acre prairie plot that's been there for just two years? Two? Fifteen? Fifteen? Thirty seven. <laughs> I had no idea that there were thirty seven different species of honeybees. I just know that there are good ones and bad ones. You know, the African-American ones that will attack you and the good ones. So, okay, so that's pretty remarkable there. Um, I, asked, I asked Mike what the significance of that is, and he said that honeybee diversity is a good indicator of ecosystem health. We also have people interested in looking at the biology. Um, I wish we would have started this process, process at the beginning before we put our first compost tea applications out, but we have people interested in doing plate counts and looking at the at the, at the biological profile as well. Okay, step six. 
expand the prairie. So now we're riding, we're riding this wave of success, right? And we want to continue our trend. Okay, so by this time we understood that the, we understood the concept, the process, the benefits, and how to use the prairies. So it's time to narrow. This is our south campus. This is a section of our south campus. And in pink you see uh, three acres of turf grass that was getting mowed on a regular basis by a big, noisy, messy contractor that cost a lot of money. So we decided to pilot this and convert it to a different type of prairie. Right. So here we are. We did use a herbicide to kill the King Ranch blue stem. I know there's some mixed opinions about that, but we need to be pragmatic. This is not a patient care area. This is a research campus. To the north in the background, where you see all those buildings, that's the main patient care area. Okay. So out came Jim Willis and the Wildlife Habitat Federation in, and we purchased individual species of forbs, which we know are wildflowers. We also purchased prairie grass, and we used this no-till seed drill to plant them. Okay. And by when we had a long winter, normal rainfalls. And by spring, we had a nice green that is given back. There is some primrose starting to flow through. And with each passing week, each passing month, something new was blooming. The colors became more intense. We started to see something that we had never seen before out there, which was what? People. <laughs> it was the strangest thing. They came out, I don't know where they came from, there were people out there every weekend. Cars lined up on the side of the road, people sitting in the in the wildflowers, having picnics, taking lot, taking uh, pictures, putting their kids and pets and in uh, you know whatever the object. They want to photograph the wildflowers. Okay. So this wave of color is kept coming and coming. And get closer. And pretty soon the afterburners were on, it was just out of control. To where we couldn't even look so bright. <laughs> Internally and externally, and yeah, these things were probably three feet tall. It's really neat. Unfortunately, they all browned out at the same time to see. So we went from beautiful to brown. And we had to we did actually mow it because we're still managing perceptions. We're, we're managing aesthetics. I will say that we had so much wildflowers, so many forbs come up. It blocked the sunlight from hitting the soil. We did not have much germination with our prairie grasses. So once we mowed this down and exposed the soil to sunlight, we started to see our blue stems and silos, uh, uh, silos of grandma, silos of grandma, some of these other prairie grasses have come up. So we, we remain local. So overall, this was, a, this was a huge success and really gave us the momentum to continue the trend. And we are now converting two more acres. So my goal is to not eliminate the grass all the way. such as prairies. And there's all sorts of combinations of, of prairie grasses and forbs that, that grow in a different place that we can manage. I don't know if you guys have ever been to um, the George Bush Library at SME. Great, beautiful example of a sustainable site with the tall grass prairies and short grass prairies that they maintain as a turf grass alternative. It's pretty neat. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned that I can't count, and that there are six steps to <laughs> Step one is to designate a site. Step two is to see the concept. This is where you are setting the expectation and educating your end consumer. Step three is establishment. Okay? And I'm um, talking about the different methods to do that. Broadcasting, using seed drill, direct planting, uh, some of the rhizomes and root stock. We talked about the importance of soil ecology. Making sure that you have a biological profile. We talked about how we use the prairie. And then we demonstrated how to expand the prairie. This is the set that threw me off and I wrote past the week. We talked about the benefits of urban prairies. Reduced impact maintenance, stormwater filtration, native plant propagation, wildlife habitat, and it's a restorative destination. 
And then lastly, we had an overarching message about sustainability. It looks different. And in order for people to accept these different features, it needs to be demonstrated by you, by me, and if you can validate it through a third party certification from Texas, Texas Parks and Wildlife, even better. We talked about Senate Bill 198, which prohibits homeowner associations from homeowner associations from banning water smart and water efficient landscapes. So work with your HOAs and landscape designers to do something and demonstrate it. Talk about the new land ethic, which is simply our guiding principle to do what's morally right for the health and sustainability of the environment and the people that use it. Uh, so health and sustainability, I believe that this is also the new value proposition for the green industry as a whole moving into the future. And this is the money shot. This is Tommy's picture here. So that's all. That's the end of the